In this week's episode of Studio Inter, we'll be reviewing the matches against Borussia Mönchengladbach and Genoa. We'll be previewing the upcoming games against Shakhtar Donetsk and Parma. We'll be breaking down Inter with Mina Arzuki, this week's Moratti, Morgi and Frog, and much, much more. Everything here on Studio Inter, on LeonSempreInter.com. Benvenuti, bentornati to another edition of Studio Inter. I'm your host Nima Tavalli Ruzzari, wishing you welcome to a new to to a new week, which definitely start we start in a much more positive tone than the one we did last week after the Derby defeat. Um, but before we get into all of, all of that, let me introduce my panelists, starting with uh, Semperinter.com's uh, preview writer, Mr. Mohamed Nassar, Mystic Mo. Mystic Mo, indeed. Yeah, yeah. Two uh, nil. Everything's great. So fantastic. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm just a bit annoyed because you were wrong on Borussia Mönchengladbach. <laughs> yeah, but I didn't. Uh, I couldn't predict uh, the UEFA Hakimi fiasco. <laughs> Jesus, yeah, yeah, that was. Yeah, yeah that was yeah, quite I, drama. I firmly believe if Hakimi was on the pitch, it, it, it probably would have been different. It was such a fine, uh, narrow margin. But yeah, anyway, it is what it is. It is what it is. And we're also joined by our very good friend, Mr. William Beckman, over in London. Hello, everyone. Uh, not quite six points, but beggars can't choose us. We'll go with four instead. Um. For sure, for sure. Uh, it's better than it was at least after the derby. Um, that's for sure. No, uh, uh, yeah, uh, and we're also joined by our very good friend from Dallas, Texas. See, I got it right this time. He's a staff yeah, editor over did. at The Athletic, <laughs> Mr. Mike Pialucci. <laughs> Reverend Mike is a little hot under the collar this week, boys. Just warning you now. Not, not good. happy. <laughs> Good, because I was not happy when Antonio Conte started whinging about Christian, being asked about Christian Eriksen. Now, I'm really glad we have a very special guest and I'm really glad that she's on because when it comes to Antonio Conte, I know I have few people in the world who agree with me as much as she does. <laughs> she <laughs> she, uh, she is on the excellent Serie Awesome pod on ESPN. She writes for ESPN FC, BBC, BT Sports, CNN, etc., etc. Welcome back, Mina Arzuki. Hi, how are you guys? Good, it's good. How are you? How are you holding up? I do feel a little bit sorry for him when he's constantly asked about Ericsson, don't you? <laughs> Stop <laughs> it. Don't. <laughs> All right, let's do this. Let's start. Let's start about that. Because th- this is the thing. When when he starts moaning about why do you always ask me about Christian Ericsson? I want to talk about players who didn't play and who sit on the bench. I have to ask if he's drunk. What what kind of what, what kind of nonsense is that? Of course they're going to ask you about one of the players who was one of the best in the Premier League. And you can't seem to get him to work in your system, which you're handsomely paid to do. It's not a conspiracy. I mean... <laughs> but one thing I've noticed about you is that every time you get something wrong, you're like, he's on 12 million. He's on 12 million. He's on 12 million. Like. <laughs> you see, <laughs> you're absolutely right about that. But that's because when that list of the what they pay, every other club in the city are pays their coaches. And I see the, the, the amount of grief that we, we 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 pay to get it's just it, it triggers me you're absolutely right mina <laughs> but, but we'll get to that a little bit longer but in a little bit while but i just wanted to start off there i mean when 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 we last i mean a lot of things have happened since you were last on and, and also last season the way it ended with 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 the drama at the the moratti's villa and and the, the table of peace and and everything else that happened and then inter's weird transfer market um how, what do you make of all, that whole situation? Um, do you think it was a situation where Antonio Conte threatened to resign, or, 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 or unless they got him Arturo Vidal, or, or, or was it a situation where, where he kind of bullied Inter into giving him what he wants, uh, or do you think that this is this is kind of a they all agreed on this, or what do you think? I think that, so basically one of the things that he got angry about is he doesn't feel that he gets, or the club gets enough protection and they don't do enough. There's too much leaks coming out of the club. 
And on this occasion, you can tell he came from a club like Juventus. Juventus and Milan are so good when it comes to chatting to broadcasters and journalists and making sure they know exactly what's being said and written about them all the time. Galliani used to have like a, a speed dial number to Sky broadcasters. And whenever they would have a story to break, he would tell them, don't break that one. I'll give you something else. But I don't want this particular thing leaked. I don't want that particular thing leaked, which is why some stories will come out like Zlatan and Sharawi or whatever it is. But certain others were hidden. Um, Real Madrid, for example, are really good at this as well. Like when Wesley Schneider came out and said I was basically drunk for most of the time. <laughs> um, uh, you know, Madrid did a great job of covering that up all the time. You never knew what was going on. Um, Inter don't do that very well. Inter don't act like a big club that terrorizes journalists. Um, they're like the nice club. And that bothers somebody like Antonio Conte because he's not used to it. He's come from all these different types of things and he wants to act and wants to feel that he is has the, and, and is afforded the protection that you get with being either with a Milan or with a Juve. So I think with that, he's he's struggling because he feels he's the guy and he doesn't get enough sort of mafiosas around him. Juventus have a guy there that is Albanese, who is quite literally the meanest thing that you'll ever see in your life. <laughs> I mean, he's picked so many fights with me. He's actually like told Dancredi to leave the room at one point. Tell me, thank you. So, I mean, they, he's used to that kind of stuff where he wants to be able to be like, no, don't write about Brozovic. Don't write about this. But he doesn't get that. So that's what he's really angry about. Um and in some ways, I can sort of understand that because it kind of seems like he's on his own on this occasion. But when it comes to Antonio Conte, the thing is, is that him demanding all of these things, what he doesn't get is that it puts so much pressure on. And we can't afford to always give you everything you want because you need to win Champions League or reach, or at least reach you know, important levels for us to be making this money back. And that's what he didn't get at Juve. It's like... Allegri could afford, we could afford Ronaldo eventually because he took us to two finals, you know. So mm. that brought in about 100 million every year, not to, not, not even to mention the branding that came with that, you know. But this is what Conte just constantly is like, well, I can't get you anywhere unless you buy me 100 players. But it needs to be self-sustainable. And I think this is where it is. But Zhang really wants to, to do something special. He's young. He wants to say, I took this team on and, and I managed to bring, you know, so much like uh, prosperity to it and we're winning stuff and he believes in Antonio Conte because he likes what he's doing and and Conte is good at that he's very good at selling himself and his vision and he's good at demanding and then sort of compromising when when the time comes I don't know how much longer they'll deal with it if the drama continues or if not enough points are accrued Mm, for sure Um, I'll hand you over to Mo did you have a question for uh, Mina yeah, it's uh, <clears throat> good that we uh, came to the how much longer uh, bit of, uh, of, of the answer because I wanted to flip it over to you, Ventus. Um, uh, when it comes to... <laughs> no, I mean, look, uh, he's, uh, Pirlo's got a, a lot of goodwill uh, already, uh, you know, uh, accruing in the bank. Mm-hmm. What, what, what do you feel like? Where, where, how, how long can this go on? Uh, um, is, is there... Do you see green shoots? Is there a project or a direction that you see forming, or is this a write-off season? And if it is a write-off season, has Ronaldo received the memo because he's not getting any younger and he, he <laughs> wants to win trophies, right? So, uh, so uh, I just I, I'm wondering if there's an incongruence between the, the the selection of the manager, the direction that the management is going with, and then of course the the, the star player and his personal desires to, towards career fulfillment. So, where where where, where do you see this project going, Mina? Yeah, I think this is you make such a valid point because the point is, is that, you know, it was a team that was building and building and and it had come sort of to the natural end where it needed to be finalized. You know, so trophies needed to be won. And one of the things that um, Allegri had said after the 2017 final is, listen, guys, you know, like like with all due respect, they can bring on Alvaro Morata and like about 15 other great players. I can bring on Mario Lemina. That's all I had on the bench, you know, and you want me to win this Champions League final against, you know, Zidane's like dynasty. And at the time, I nearly really agreed with him. And he realized that he would need to eventually give him a big star name or a big midfielder or something so that they can win this. The problem is, is it resulted in getting Ronaldo, but the rest of the team ended up being a little bit of a disaster. Beppe Marotta warned about this. Um, And he, you see, I think they have two visions. One of them is branding because they, they realize that the money is made 
the way that Florentino Perez did it at Real Madrid, which is by getting Galacticos, which is by sort of hyping everything up and they can grow their brand on Instagram. The other side of it is what happens when you go into branding is that usually the sporting project ends up falling. And that's almost a sacrifice that they've had to make, because if you want to buy Ronaldo, then you can't really afford to also bring in like a, you know, a Modric and an Isco and a Cruz. <laughs> um, so <laughs> that's that, that's where it all falls apart. And so and then it was like, OK, let's do all of this and let's hopefully get Allegri to bring it all together because he's really good at doing that. <sighs> Sadly, it, you know, he was trying to explain to them, you know, there's no point buying me a Ronaldo if you don't also buy me an Isco. And, and I don't know how to work with Dybala. Um, Dybala and him just never really seemed to have that kind of chemistry. And the midfield, to be fair to him, wasn't really great. I mean, it was Matuidi, Hedera was always injured, you know. Pjanic, who I don't even want to speak about him because he irritates me so much. <laughs> and so eventually, um, eventually, you know, unfortunately, he had to make way. And, and Yeli didn't want to. He really didn't want him to go. But Nedved insisted that, you know, the whole point of modern football was that it needed to be attacking. And so let's bring in Maurizio Sarri. Now, from my conversations from Paratici back in the day, he didn't seem to love Sarri. He used to always say to me, he's a really good coach, but not for Juve. You don't understand what it takes to coach Juve. So I thought it was very bizarre that they would go for Sarri. And in my head, I'm like, that's got to be Nedved, because I know Agnelli loves um Allegri, and I know that Paratici wasn't keen about Sari coming in, so this has got to be old Nedved. And Marotta had already left because they thought that he was too much of a traditionalist and that they wanted to entrust this team to, you know, a young vision that cared more about branding than it did about sporting achievements. And which was a huge loss because I think that he's the great thing about Inter right now is Beppe Marotta. So I think this is where it's all fallen apart. And now they just don't know what to do. They've got the big names. You know, in the sense that they've got Ronaldo, they've got Dybala, they're, you know, Alvaro Morata, but there seems to be no balance at the moment. How can you choose, you know, and I love Keza, by the way, I'm a big fan of him, but how can you choose him over Awar from, from Leon? Can you not see that this is a team that really needs a midfield that, or some level of intellect in the middle there? Because it's not just, it's just not working and it hasn't worked for very many years. So right now they just think, OK, well, we've got to rely on individual ability at the moment. And hopefully that's how we'll get through, because Ronaldo was individual ability with Real Madrid. A lot of the times they did come to depend on him. And the problem with having a big star like that is that you come to depend on him. And when he leaves, you have to start that whole process of rebuilding again, what, which is what Madrid is doing. Um, it's a shame because it just looks like there's been no thought put into this. It's kind of like haphazard the way that it's been going. And I'd love to say to you, you know, back in the day, Juventus had a clear plan and stuff. I think a lot of the time they got lucky. So because I really do think that on, on the most occasions, other than the way that Liverpool has done so, people are just lucky with the way that they go about and, and get players, you know. Um, Milan wanted to change everything and realise it's working, so they held off. But I can't see what's the point of going and taking all these chances, going for Sadi, sacking him, then going for Pirlo because you know, there's no other alternative. Um, because they're too embarrassed to go back to Allegri and say to him, we failed without you. That was what it was. And Nedved would have, you know, lost all his power, to be frank. Mm. So it's like, OK, well, let's give Pirlo this chance. It may all come together. But right now, to me, these aren't experiments. It's almost reckless what he's doing. So mm. I, I honestly don't know. Well, yeah, yeah, but but uh, I can I I understand that, but at least at least you're not paying him twelve million net per year. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know how much Cholo Simeone is on? I think he's like thirty. <laughs> you're going to kill yourself if he ever comes. <laughs> yeah, he's the right. highest paid coach in Europe, I think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Even more than Pep, right? Yeah, yeah, a lot more, I think. Oh, oh wow. Will ask you? Do you have a question for me now? Yes, uh, if, I suppose it follows on quite nicely from um, the discussion about Juventus because, you know, this has been a, a very strange season so far. We knew it would be um, in terms mm. of performances and results. And, you know, this weekend, obviously, with Juventus not beating Verona and Atalanta losing home to, to Sam, um, Milan doing better than we'd expected, etc. You know, it, it, it feels like there's no clear hierarchy at the top. Um, and I think that it's worth remembering this is not a question, I'm just saying in general that we've been obviously quite worried about inter um, problems in the last few games. But, you know, frankly, at the moment, everyone's kind of got problems. So, you know, it's not going to take the perfect team to win this league title this season. So I was just wondering, you know, have you got a favourite at the moment for this league title? And also, how many teams do you think are in it? Because it does feel like this is a year where, I don't know, something strange could happen. And, 
it's it's very difficult to to make sense of everything that's going on at the moment at least I think so anyway yeah it's true you're right because even if you look across all leagues you know like the performance of Manchester United the performance of Manchester City um you look at you know <laughs> Barcelona aren't even in the top 10 um so it's kind of all crazy when you go around because of this COVID hit season and we don't know where everyone's going to come up listen I don't I think when it comes to the top, I do. I, I didn't see this before, but Nima mentioned Napoli as being the ones that he thinks are going to win the Scudetto. And and I look at that team, and one of the problems that I always had with them is I never thought that they had a guy that was ruthless enough at the top. And what they do have now is Osman, who is so intelligent and so smart. So it looks like the squad doesn't actually have that many gaps. Um, and it's perfectly balanced. And they have a coach that's really bought into everything and, and allowing the players to buy into everything. But for me, they're still a very emotional team. So like Lazio, they are a very emotional team. So I wonder on a psychological level how these guys will handle it when the going gets tough. I'm very big on psychology, even though Gab shouts at me every time I say that. <laughs> um, um, he, he's like, this makes no sense. You know, who cares about psychology? Um, but I do think like a lot of the time, I, you know, like Milan is a very young squad and bring, bringing in somebody who's old who can absorb the pressure like Zlatan can has made the difference. Psychology makes the difference. And what they're doing so well is that they're slow and steady. And they're not necessarily wowing you all the time. They haven't put in the types of performances Milan that have, you know, made me think, wow. But they have intelligence in different areas of the pitch that I think is sort of missing from Juventus. Um, I know that sounds crazy to say this because they have lots of veteran experience, but that midfield is void of any intellect. And the forward Even line... Arthur Melo. Yeah. <laughs> It's not that he's not, it's not like they're stupid. It's like, <laughs> that. I'm, it's, it's about knowing what to do when the situation calls on it. And there's, there's a difference between balance and then there's intelligence. Mm. So, for example, like Real Madrid played and went on a 23 um, game winning streak and they had Isco, Kroos, um, Modric and Isco, Kroos, Modric who was it at the time, and and one other player, oh yeah, James Rodriguez. Now, none of them know, there isn't a Kante in there, there isn't a Makaleli, there isn't a defensive player in there, but because all four are so smart, they could make it work. So, if you want to have a midfield that's like that, that's super smart, I don't think there's many of them, or you have one that's perfectly balanced, in the sense that you have Benacer and Kessi, or you have Lucas Leva with, you know, Sergio Mm -hmm. Milinkovic-Savage and Luis Alberto, that's always perfectly balanced. True. Um, but that's what I think is missing from Juventus and Inter. So really going forward, I think psychology is going to play a role. Who can, who's got squad depth to handle all the various competitions? If one of them is knocked out early, you know, then that will also make a huge difference when it's their right to the front. I think Atalanta managed to finish top four because of the fact that Champions League was reserved for August and they didn't have to do two, two competitions in the same time. And I think that has also affected Inter last season too, doing so many competitions which is why squad depth now should help them, but <clears throat> we don't know. <laughs> no, we don't. In in, def- in defence of um, Arthur Mello, he is more intelligent than the last Mello you just had in their midfield. <laughs> oh, <laughs> absolutely! But I—that's the low bar. <laughs> that is okay, the very low that's, bar. that's true. And he's also sane, which the other Mello was not. <laughs> so that also helps. But I, I do uh, think intelligence <laughs> needs intelligence around it. Like I do, like I really like him. He gets a lot of criticism, Artur, because apparently he's slowing the game down. I think he's slowing the game down because he's like, whoa, guys, what's wrong with you? <laughs> like, <to> Calm down. <laughs> yeah. And like, you know, let's take a breath and figure this out. But they don't want to figure this out, you know. So I think he is more intelligent than the rest of the squad, but he's got to be surrounded by players who are at least understanding his wavelength. And I'm not sure he gets that with with Juventus because they're all so determined to impress Pirlo that they're getting red cards to show them how much they care, you know? <laughs> uh, Mike, did you have a question for Mina? Absolutely. Um, you know what, Mina? You, you know what Nima thinks about uh, Antonio Conte. Uh, <laughs> we're about to complain about Antonio Conte in this podcast when you hop off. I want to hear your take about this. And the reason I want to hear this is because, you know, watching, for instance, you know, watching Jose Mourinho in the Premier League, right? Mm-hmm. All, I don't think anybody understands better how the ways in which he's not quite what he used to be, better than an Inter fan who saw it up front when he was in Italy at the top of his game. You know, I can, I see 
what he isn't because I saw what he was. And so you're someone who watched a lot of Juventus during that golden period with Antonio Conte. Is this the same guy and is he enough of the same guy to get the results that the 12 million net uh, expectations demand, right? I mean, <laughs> I, you know, obviously all coaches evolve, all coaches change, but is there enough still there that you look at him and say, yes, this is the top class manager that really can get this done for Inter? Or are you watching and looking and saying, you know what, maybe this isn't quite what he used to be and it's enough of a change that this investment might, might not turn out the way that the Jong family is hoping it will? It's an interesting question, actually, because I... <sighs> You know what it is? I feel like we all learn on the job, like whether you're a journalist, whether you're a coach or a player, you're always learning on the job. And when he arrived at Juventus, it was like we I mean, I definitely thought he was the best player, like coach in the world. I was like, this is such an amazing man. Like, look at the way that everyone talks about him. They say he's the best man manager they've ever had. We went from seventh place to, to not losing a match, you know. And I was wowed by him to the extent that when he wanted to leave, I was, you know, like, like I was having anxiety at night, you know, thinking that's it, it's over, yeah. you know. And it's so amazing how, and then, and then I, I had that it's Allegri. And I just thought, oh, my God, not this man, you know. Like, I thought he was a great tactician, terrible man manager. That was always my view of him. And I just thought this was going to be a disaster until I saw... <laughs> what a really intelligent man is like. I know that sounds yes, so awful, exactly. but you sort, of, you sort of don't know what you have or lost and, I, until you yeah. see the next person. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, and, for sure. And Conte, I already appreciate Max Levy more watching Antonio Conte. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, by, by the day. By the day. <laughs> yeah, but there were so many things that obviously that irritated me at the time when, for example, you know, we had come out with all these really embarrassing things like, you know, we won all of this on the pitch and, you know, like Caltropoli and all of that. And I'm like, oh, God, this is so embarrassing, you know. And and then you come out, you're part of this, you know, management team, Antonio Conte, that is like trying to fly the flag for Juventus. We want everything on the pitch. We're the best team in Serie A. And then you're accusing Fabio Capello because he criticized you, you know, mm. and saying, yeah, well, all he's known for is losing his Scudetti. And I'm like, oh, my God, you're going against everything that's making sense, you know, because your pride, because your ego was hit slightly, you know. Secondly, the kind of players he wanted were like atrocious. Like he was banging the <laughs> drum for Theo Walcott. I mean, that's all he did was cry. Iturbe. Was he resigned <laughs> because they didn't give him Iturbe. Because exactly. Marotta refused to pay 30 million euros for Juan Iturbe. <laughs> I mean, it, but I think Marotta played that so well. He's like, yeah, yeah, don't worry. Discussions are ongoing. You know? <laughs> and it's like, let's stretch this out as long as possible until we're too late. Oh, we ran out know? of time. Oh, oh so the fax sad. machine broke. Get, get on know? the phone to Walter Sabatini. You, you exactly. Yeah, exactly. We haven't quite finished yet. <laughs> It was those. It was like, how? How are these players the ones that you want so badly? You know, and so it was. That was what it was. And and then you got Allegri, and I just remember Allegri walks in, and 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 he would take five minutes to figure out what the team was going to be. He took one look at Vidal and was like, not really for me. So you can get rid of him. <laughs> yeah. And he kept him for a year, and but he just couldn't work with him at the time. And then it was it was just the way that he developed players because it was no longer about what was missing. Whereas now, like you look at Inter and York, oh, they're really missing a defensive midfielder or Juventus are really missing this. And used to just make it work with whatever he had. And I don't know what, what mm -hmm. it was, you know, he turned Tevez from being a guy that was kind of selfish up front to being one that was now laying it out for Alvaro Morata, helping him, developing him, talking to him. And I was like, what's going on, you know? All of a sudden, Paul Pogba wasn't just shooting from distance all the time, but there was more to his game. There was Marquisio found his flow and was now the director of everything going on because, you know, Pelo was going to go. And and I just thought that what Allegri did is, is and what he's so good at, maybe because he was, as a player, that kind of guy, he was technically gifted and he knew how to bring out the good at, at Juventus play, in, you know, in Juventus, the players. Whereas what Antonio is really good at is, and what was so important when he arrived is he knows how to train Antonio Conte's. He knows how to turn a squad into warriors. So he masks all their deficiencies because that's what he did as a player. Mm -hmm. He wasn't very good and he was surrounded by so much talent at the time. And he speaks about it in so many of these interviews. And he said, so I learned to just work harder than everyone to mask all the things that I didn't have when you compared me to the likes of Zinedine Zidane or Gianluca Vialli or Alessandro Del Piero. So that's what he spent most of his life doing was masking the deficiencies by working super hard. And that's why he ends up teaching everyone. 
So when it comes to doing basic things and getting you to work really hard and be really determined, he's the best. But when it comes to sort of extracting the magic, he doesn't know how to do that because he never had any magic. Mm, that's, that's a good point. That's a very that good point. Found it. I'm now really sad. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I just, I think this is like, this is, I think, what, what we realized. I mean, he would say a few things at the time, like the Galatasaray thing that I just feel like really knocked the confidence of some of our players, you know, where he was like, well, it's between us and Galatasaray for second place in the Champions League. And I'm like, where are Juventus? You know, what, what do you mean it's between us and Galatasaray? You know, you can like you see should. So many crazy yeah. Things. I you mean, should not say, like, you know, it, it, it was like that whole comment about Cagliari and, and Sassuolo, you know? Yeah, I know. We only buy players from Sassuolo and Cagliari. I mean, that, but that's, I mean, that's, I mean this, this season we've been treated to his identity crisis where he seems to think that, you know, the stuff he said, I mean, now he's changed that back again. But in the beginning of the season, the first two matches, he was talking about nonstop about how, you know, I don't care if we concede three or four as long as we score five or six. You know, and it's like, when did you... So now you're Zdenek Zeman all of a sudden? Like, what's going on here? And and it's and, and Inter are some sort of expensive version of Atalanta? It's just, no. I don't know. The the guy, the guy is... Uh, the, this, it's it's always something with him. And I just feel that it will... As long as he's there, it's, it's going to be... Um, you know, James Horncastle says that no, this is a new Antonio Conte. He never says anything. You know, he's he's they dressed him down. He never says anything interesting anymore. And I'm like, well, I guess well he's not. I guess they found the right you know the the right medication, but but he still says some stupid stuff and and insane stuff and 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 and, and this notion about it's never his fault and everyone else's fault and you know all that stuff. He just cannot. His ego is so 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 brittle and so sensitive and and it's yeah. just it, it, it's incredibly frustrating it's really frustrating because right now at inter the way i look at it is he's he's created so much confusion from we're only five games in and inter have been everything from atalanta to to zeman's roma in the 90s and now back to conte's juve and <laughs> barella's played in three positions um, I mean, we're, we're, Lukaku is the only one that's saving Inter right now. I mean, if we look at the Borussia Mönchengladbach game, and I thought, you know, we, since you're here, we can talk about it. I mean, that game to me, finally Inter had some stability in the first half. Um, finally, Inter looked that's like they he were, started the right midfield for once. For once, exactly. He played Barella Vidal and Eriksen, but then you know he started Alexis Sanchez when he should have started Lautaro Martinez, and 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 he did in the second half, and it looked good. It finally worked. It finally looked good, and you saw even with Alexander Kolarov on the pitch that it wasn't an Andy Van Perisic next to him. It wasn't that bad because they kind of, you know, they they kind of uh, it, it, there was balance, you know, um, and. Uh, the, the issue the, the issue is that that the, for me is that you know w- when you move about too much when you create too much confusion the the players forget to express themselves individually and they and they and that and that that that, that prevents them from from being as good as they are and i think arturo vidal is a great example of that he's not the vidal i mean the, the things we saw against borussia mönchengladbach wasn't just him being tired or his physique or him just looking like an old man surrounded by young young people it's also the fact that he looks hampered and they all look a little mm-hmm. bit hampered and that that to me is is a, is is worrisome because you can't always count on lukaku bailing you out you know and and that, that that worries me. I think that the issue. Well, okay. Firstly, let me put it out there. I think the Bundesliga is probably the worst league in Europe. Um, <laughs> and so Ooh, that's spicy. And I know, and I know this is so Ooh, controversial. We get pretty terrible. <laughs> But I was listening to your last part and they were like all like Marco Rose and he's so tactically gifted and I'm like, yeah, until he goes to PSG, loses every game and then everyone's like, what's going on? Um, <laughs> because that was what Thomas Tuchel was, right? <laughs> and he's like the worst manager. How he reached the final is beyond me. You just need to talk to Jules and <laughs> about this. Anyway, oh. but I, Munch and Gladbach are good for a certain level, but and they are defensively better than everything else there, but that's really not saying very much. They're a very poor team, in my opinion. Um, and I think you made them look better than they were, you know, and that they are. And I do feel like you missed a trick there because you mentioned the fact that it was like your Slavia Prague yeah. and that you really didn't want it to start off that way. Um, you're right, there is all of these... The, this is the other thing that I have. It's a little bit like Jose Mourinho. 
Um, I'm, I used to really like Pepe. I, and I mention a lot Real Madrid, I know, because I, I just feel like, because Jose Mourinho is so much like Conte, but in different ways, at least that one can win in Europe. But you know what I mean? There's... Um, Pepe was always a very angry player and a player who's like a warrior, but like your Barella, your Arturo Vidal's. If you have a coach who's always, you know, banging the drum, sometimes it keeps you on an edge where I don't think you perform at your best because your mm. your emotions are so heightened all the time. And this is what worries me with Antonio Conte because I think it takes a lot mentally to play with him, to play for him. Like it, it is those simple mistakes that you'll do because he's screaming that you're like you said, you can't develop your own thought. You can't sort of see the spaces because he's just screaming the whole time or <laughs> telling you to remember something or you're trying to be like, wait, hold on. Am I supposed to be in this position or that position? Yeah, that you ha- yeah there's exactly. no freedom. Yeah, that's exactly what I meant. That's exactly what I meant. Yeah. I absolutely agree with that. And that's what you you feel like after he goes, you can breathe a sigh of relief because you can now think for yourself, like, where am I supposed to go now? You know, and I think that he knows that, which is why sometimes he sits down and and tries not to scream and allows them to do their own thing. But I I think playing for him keeps them on such an edge where and he doesn't really necessarily know how to bring out the things that they are really good at, the technique that they're good at. Because, again, he just wants to see them run and win the duel and, and make sure that they're covering more space than is humanly possible yeah. at that moment. Yeah, it's so frantic. Everything with him it feels so frantic. And, 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 and that no one can work at that, that speed for 90 minutes throughout a season. It's just not doable. And he seems to not get that. And and that's what's worrying, I think, that, that, that to me, you know. Also I, because people see people like, you know, Leeds Bielsa and everyone's like, wow, look at that. But then there's a reason why they've had drop offs and there's a reason why they took longer than they needed to to get promoted because mm. no one, like you said, can sustain that for so long. No. Um, well, before we let you go, I just wanted to quickly ask you about uh, who you think, like your top six in the Serie A, who you, who win the Coppa Italia, the Supercoppa, and Capo Camonieri. <laughs> you love asking. Me. Yes, I love that, and I do. We do it to everyone who comes on, and I'm going to put in a list at the end of the season, and then just say who 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 did the best. <laughs> so, oh. so uh, yeah, come on, <laughs> who'll win? Um, I still think it's Juve. So, mm, yeah, so do I. I don't know why, even though I think Pirlo is shockingly bad at this moment <laughs> in time. And I think the, the, the team is, is void of real ability in midfield. But you just you just feel like Ronaldo is enough, right? Mm. So who will finish second? Like, who do you think will take the, the Champions League and Europe, Europa League spot? So two to six. You don't need to give an exam, an explanation. Just, just give them a... Enter. Milan, Napoli, Atalanta, mm. Roma. Mm. Capo Canoniere, I mean, will will anyone stop Ronaldo? I mean, is it Lukaku yeah. Ronaldo? Yeah, Lukaku. You think Lukaku? Okay. Mm. What about Coppa Italia and Supercoppa? Napoli for... Supercoppa or Coppa? I actually think for both. Yeah. I was going to say they could, they, yeah. could, they could do that. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Mina. It's always a pleasure. Oh, thanks, guys. It was really fun to watch. Yeah. Uh, listen, uh, talk. God, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I just ask one more question? For sure. You, Mina, sure. very quickly. Yeah. Um, sure. Juventus have played their last two matches in pink and orange. I just want to know, <laughs> yeah. are, you, are you offended to your very core by what we saw in Kiev in particular? I mean, someone tweeted a picture of Borat wearing an outfit that was very similar to that orange outfit. It was abominable <laughs> listen I, I just think that they're sort of you know like uh, trying to show you what this year is really about which is just a, it's a disgraceful year and so they want to symbolize it with their shirt <laughs> well good answer <laughs> they've taken they've they produced a jersey to symbolize 2020 i like yeah that. but the pink <laughs> one was designed by pharrell williams <laughs> yeah was you he think sober? he did a better design than that. <laughs> was he sober when he designed it? <laughs> like, exactly. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much, Mina. It's at Mina Arzuki on Twitter, right? Yes. Please, um, I just want to, like, you know, I, I just want to hear your thoughts on Munch and Gladbach because I'm dying to know what you guys think. So I'll definitely be listening in. Oh, cool. Definitely. Um, uh, well, Mo, did you want to go? Did you uh, want to hear your thoughts on Munch and Gladbach? 
Yeah, no, honestly, I think um, I, I think the like Mina believes in psychology. I, I always believe in, in stories and story arcs. I think uh, losing Hakimi on the day uh, after the derby loss uh, just uh, framed the match in a very bizarre light. Uh, Darmian uh, playing uh, his uh, debut match uh, in the opener for the Champions League. Um, I, I, I have seen. Uh, I, I have seen. You know, uh, replays of the of the second uh, Gladbach goal uh, and the offside, uh, seemingly very very tight. Uh, but you know, I can't complain too much because I'm always of the opinion that eh, in a 50-50 we give it to the attackers. Um, yeah, I just I, I I think I think Gladbach did very little, and again, it was it was just a case of being wasteful in front of goal and uh, we were lucky in in, th- in that particular case that uh, Lukaku bailed uh, bailed the team out uh, but yeah it was a very it was a, all in all a forgettable match thank god we got the the one point and thankfully uh, you know Madrid had been beaten earlier earlier in the day uh, at home by uh, Shakhtar so uh, i think it's not a disaster uh, in in the grand scheme of things and I think more importantly was the the towards the season the overall story of uh, the season was the performance against the uh, Genoa subsequently in the league and I think now looking back at the back at the Gladbach game we can say it's in the past you know we're just young is back today Gagliardini and Radu both both tested negative uh, Hakimi is back uh, you know so we're just waiting for Skriniar to come back from Slovenia I think Slovakia Slovenia Slovakia uh, yeah um, so yeah I think I think um, that that tough rough spell is behind us and the game both the derby and the Gladbach game were pretty uh, emblematic of, of that rough spell and I hope it's uh, it's in the past now Okay, can I ask you guys just a question? Just where do you think that that Inter will end up in the Champions League? Mike, uh, you, want, you, you want to go first, Mike? I mean, I'm I'm at the point where I'd like to think they get out of the group. They should get out of the group, but man, this I mean, the Gladbach game had some flashbacks to Lazio. They they play Lazio. A point isn't bad, but you know, it was a match when you realized there was a there was a red card on the pitch, and it was for Chiro Mobile. You sit there and go, well, you need to get three points out of that. And then Juventus drops, you know, a full match the same week, so it's a missed opportunity. You go to this past week, they should have beaten Gladbach. They don't. Meanwhile, Real Madrid gets beaten outright by Donetsk. It's a missed opportunity, and I just worry that they find a way not to go through. I mean, the mm. ceiling, I think, is you just go through and you lose in the first knockout stage. And frankly, I'm fine with that. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm much more concerned about the league, but I just don't know if I even trust this team to get through the group, the group stage because it's so compact this year. And Conte still, like Nima said, doesn't even know what he wants to do yet. And I'm worried that, as, you know, if he figures it out, you know, because I don't think it's a win, but if he does figure it out, maybe it's too late and they've just bled too many points. That's what mm-hmm. I'm concerned about. That's exactly where I am. That's exactly where I am. Guys, you must uh, you must have more belief in the force, young Jedi. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on here? Where is the faith? This is the thing on here. You know, this is the league. Well, this is the uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Conte is, is, is Emperor Palpatine. <laughs> okay, this is we, the force. <laughs> Okay, like, this, okay. This, <laughs> okay, let me ask you this. <laughs> if you had Messi, where do you think you'd end up? Oh, oh terrible, terrible. Oh, Wait, terrible. be on the bench, so exactly the same. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll, I'll tell you where he'd be. I'll tell you where he'd be. He'd be, he'd be on left wing back instead of Perisic, <laughs> being yelled at by Conte and ignoring him. <laughs> and we'd have a full-on session. <laughs> Tackle the guy. That's not what I do. <laughs> you just imagine, like, just the whole messy thing. Like, when people were saying that, and I was making fun of it, going, well, of course I'm making fun of it, because the very idea that Gagliardini and Messi are in the same team, <laughs> coached by Antonio Conte, is bonkers. <laughs> okay, but do you think that they do better than the group stage? That's all I'm asking, if you had Messi. So it's Antonio course, yeah. Conte that you don't believe in, then. It's not the team. No, it's for me, I, it's I, all I feel... Both. A little bit about exactly, uh, exactly. I believe in Conte uh, completely. I'm, I'm, I'm all in the Conte trainer. Huh? 
So mm. uh, don't don't don't, me, don't let me in with that. Mike and Tim. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey, Mo, Mo is our ray of sunshine in this podcast. He is. He really <laughs> is. Your positive note. Yeah. Okay. He is Mr. I think, he's the, I think he's the only one who's expecting the last sixteen. I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. Uh, no, okay. I, I, what about if you had Toro Simeone? Where do you think you'd end up? We'd so win, I want to know what it's about. We win the treble oh, wow. with Toro Simeone. Oh, yeah. No, but seriously, uh, Cholo, with Toro Simeone, the thing with him is that first of all, he gets Inter. He understands how the club works. He would avoid a lot of conflicts that Conte just doesn't can help himself to create. He knows how which conflicts to pick and which ones to leave alone, and thereby also uniting this entire club. He knows how to build a dressing room. He knows how to. He's very pragmatic. He knows exactly when he goes into a game how to get the best out of that game, and that's what Inter's always been. So I think with him, Inter can actually win something. I think with Conte it'll be difficult because I think they're like you, like you alluded to earlier, Mina. He doesn't he doesn't get certain things how they work at Inter because he's been at Juventus all his life, mm. and and Ch- Simeone has that, doesn't have that problem. He understands. He knows exactly how Inter works, uh, in, inside and out. Where, this is where Nima and I differ because I've lost a lot of faith in Simeone the last several years. Um, really? Yeah, I mean he's just. The guy that he used to be, it just feels very much, you know, he, he's in the Mourinho and he's in the Conte camp for me of just he's sort of becoming a pastiche of himself. Of it's He used to be a lot more tactically flexible. His, you know, there used to be a lot more creativity in the midfield. Now it's the 4-4-2 all the time. And, you know, I, I'm one of my very good friends is, uh, is an Atleti fan, and he just is tortured watching this man every week because he's like, I don't think people realize, and I think he's right, that there just isn't. He just won't adapt anymore. I mean, this is a guy who's sitting there throwing Diego Costa out there well past his sell-by date. And, you know, to the point where Alvaro Morata's like, get me out of here because I should be <laughs> starting over this man. What is going on? Um, to me, I just – I don't know how much of a place there is in the modern game for a manager who has to have his, you know, his ideology, his tactics, and he can't be flexible anymore. And that's what I worry about with – I mean, we're seeing it with Marino the last several years in the EPL, right? Now it's 4-2-3-1 all the time. He's picking fights in the dressing room. We're seeing it with Conte here where he can't adapt. I think Simeone is going down that path. I mean, to me, the, I, I'm all on the Max Allegri train at this point for yeah, everything no, that you no, had no. already no. said, Mina. I mean, that no. – yeah. But, no, I mean, no that, you're not allowed him, no. Yeah. <laughs> you see, that's the truth. It's this the is, right decision. Exactly. No, exactly. Yeah, yeah. no she, honestly. She's scared. I, that, is, that is reason enough. Side I, can't, I can't. I can't. I can't. I can't see him anywhere. I will lives. die. I will become a fan of that club. I love that man so much. Come on, <laughs> I come aboard. Uh, I mean, yeah. look, it's, sometimes it doesn't have to be that hard. And when every reputable source would, for the, you know, for the 10 days when it seemed like Allegri might come in this summer, when every reputable source was like, yeah, he's just going to build the whole team around Christian Eriksen. It's like, yeah, it's not that difficult. You really don't have to make it that hard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you know what? You know what Allegri always does when he loses? He laughs in his excuse. He makes a joke. I always quite liked that when he was at Juventus. So, you know, I know. I, I was, you know, it was sort of, he, he found that kind of, you know, the Livornese Indian came out and he'd make a stupid <laughs> joke about, you know, oh, well, oh, it was a good thing because we need to wake up or, you know, oh, no. he, he just, he has the communication is, is fun. I, I think yeah. he's good. Oh, God. Thank, you so much. Thank you so much for coming on, Mina. Really Thanks, guys. Thank you, Mina. Pleasure to have you I think on. you should start a Juve pod too. You can be mean <laughs> about them. I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. I, but, um, yeah, I'd love doing pods with you, but I don't know about you, pod. <laughs> that part, you... No, You're like, not... listen, <laughs> let's not push yeah. it. Okay. Exactly. No, okay, okay. Late. I'll leave it, I'll leave it. <laughs> Thanks, Mina. Take Thanks care. Thanks for having Th- me on. Take care, guys. Always a pleasure. You, Speak man. soon. Thanks. Bye. Take care. Bye. <laughs> right. Um, after the... Um, after the game against uh, Borussia Mönchengladbach, uh, it was a game against Genoa, which, to be an, uh, to be honest, I mean... As you said, Mo, I think you already said everything there is to be said about that game. It was conditioned by the Champions League game, and it was just about winning three points. Not much to say. The only thing I want to say is Christian Eriksen, and maybe I'm alone in this, but I thought that in those two games against Gladbach and Genoa, especially in the first half against Genoa, I saw an embryo of something that I really, really liked. And I think that this is going in the right direction if he's given some con- you know, continued... If he's if he's if he's going to be played some more, so that he can have some consistency in his game time and finally learn to to understand what it is that Conte wants from him. Um, do you guys agree, Mike? I mean, yeah. I mean, look, I'm 
I, I feel like every time I'm on this podcast, I somehow talk about this, right? You know, th maybe this is my hot button issue. Maybe you beautiful listeners at home are sitting there going, oh, the new guy just talks about Christian Erickson. But I mean, look, I get that this is not Tottenham Christian Erickson, right? We're not talking about that guy yet. You know, he was, I thought he was very good in the Champions League match. I thought he was good on Saturday. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, even this guy who isn't what he has been and what he can be yet, there were probably what? eight, nine between those two matches, really good balls up the middle, beautiful chances that nobody else in this team can create. I mean, it's it, at the end of the day, you know, you guys I, I had a phenomenal discussion last week. I was jealous. I couldn't be there for it. You know, when you're talking about Conte's idea of attacking football, right? And whether he's really doing this for, you know, in earnest or he's just adapting, whatever it is. But the fact of the matter is there is no great team in the world that plays attacking football that can't create chances up the middle. There just isn't one. And this team without Erickson, nobody else consistently creates chances up the middle except this guy. And that alone is the reason why you have to keep him in there, right? Like I get the Twitter conversation that happened afterwards about, you know, Barella comes in, Erickson comes off, Barella makes the pass, Erickson didn't make that pass. First of all, I agree with Paulo Kondo that you could have just substituted out Brozovic and probably would have had some similar results. But exactly. I get that, you know, that Barella comes in and makes that pass. And I get just like after the Fiorentina match, people are saying, oh, Stefano Sensi comes in. He creates the goal, not Erickson. And I get that Brozovic kicked goal, uh, you know, this weekend that Erickson set pieces didn't produce yet. But this is really about process versus outcomes. This is really about committing to a bigger idea versus not. As Neva says, this is about what progress you want to make. And if you look at the bigger sample of just what all these players are in this midfield, not, you know, cherry pick their best moments of the season, but what do we know about their body of work for the last three years? And what have we seen from Erickson now that we've had two starts to actually see him create a bit? It's obvious that, look, I've seen Nicolo Barella play a full match in that, you know, in the hole in the number 10 role, this new system Conte's coming up with. I've seen 90 minutes of that. Guess what? There are no consistent chances created up the middle. I saw Stefano Sensi start the two matches after Fiorentina. He looked mediocre. He picked up a red card and now he's hurt again. I've seen Marcelo Barella for so long that there's a reason we all were losing our minds in collective joy when they got Erickson because, oh my God, there's an actual set piece threat here. If you commit to this guy and you give him a chance and you build around this, he can do things that none of those guys can do consistently. You can sit there and you want to cherry pick a moment or two in which they can do Christian Erickson-like things. Sure. And I love all three of those players for reasons. Nico Barella should be starting every single week. He should just be playing. But the bottom line is this could be progress and this should be progress. And the reason I'm so frustrated is I have very little doubt that this will not be progress because Conte will not commit to this. You know, if you just on Wednesday, they had the right midfield. They put Lautaro out there after the break. They even they looked even better than they did in the first half. This was without Ashraf Hakimi. If there's any player on this team that's going to benefit from Ashraf Hakimi, it's Christian Eriksen because he needs space. Well, what happens when Hakimi's out there? It's it's like a magnet. You have to mark him. You have to pay attention to him because he's so electric that he's going to carve you apart if you don't. If you really give the, that midfield a chance with Lautaro up front, with Hakimi outright, that could create so many things offensively to the point where then the trickle-down effect is you don't have to play uh, Perisic on the left wing and bleed possession, or not bleed possession, sorry, bleed chances down that flank. You could start any of Darmian or Young or um, even Kolarov because that can work a little bit better and you'd have more defensive solidity there because you'll have chances up the middle. He unlocks so many things, and I feel like I'm getting gaslit every time there are people complaining about watching this guy play because they're just so obvious if you watch that he can do things and create opportunities that don't exist otherwise. But unless you commit to that and really give it time to grow, it won't bloom into fruition. Mike, Mike. I, I, I can't uh, agree with I, I can't agree with what what you said uh, anymore. The exactly. only the only uh, exactly. thing I uh, I would like to believe otherwise is that I don't I, I think Conte is savvy to this I think Conte realizes this and I think if we look at the the men available barring the first three games of the season where where physical condition and and, and uh, readiness was probably uh, less than optimal for everyone and they were he was still trying to find the the pieces but I think it's clear uh, Hakimi on the right. Uh, anyone on the left, not Perisic, and uh, somehow with Gagliardini, Barella, and uh, or Vidal, Barella, and and uh, Ericsson. I think this is th this is ultimately uh, the 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 correct attacking module that he's looking for. But he just hasn't been able to select that consistently. And I think this is this is why he's been playing Ericsson. He's been starting with Ericsson, getting him in for 60 minutes plus in the last couple of games. I I, I reckon. Maybe not tomorrow night in uh, in, in in Donetsk, but uh, against Parma, we'll probably see Ericsson start again. 
for sure. I really hope and, so. My my yeah. one concern is just that I mean he gets subbed off for Brozovic, um, you know, on Wednesday they take him out, you know, and leave Brozovic on on Saturday. I that's my concern is that he would prefer Brozovic in there, and I love Marcelo, but I mean I this is. We're going on 10 months now of him being just a disaster. Yeah, yeah. Since, no, no, the, he's, since he's, the start of the new year, it's been bad. He's been very, uh, and yeah, he, very poor. I, and he's not, he's not on the same wavelength as Eric. They just, I was watching them closely in the first half, and there'll be times when, you know, Brozvich is like he didn't, not that he was, it's like he didn't really he didn't sort of acknowledge Ericsson's existence in that little space in front of general's defense you know he'd, he'd play out to someone that was on the other side of the pitch yeah. or you know he can't play together yeah they i think that's together. i think that's that's a shame but i i don't see any way that those two can play properly together they just don't seem to have that kind of you know that kind of spark that you'd want so i think it makes much more sense with Virela and, and vidal behind obviously conte probably rested Varela because um you know he, but he the get thing is, now, he's got, now he's got raja nangolan as well and i honestly think that raja nangolan you know barella raja vidal um, since you know, even Sensi, that behind Christian Eriksen and Hakimi, as you said, Darmian on the left or Ashley Young, that gives you what you need to 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 win in the Serie A and also in Europe. I honestly think so. But um, but I mean, I, I'm not too the Galliardini thing. You know, I I think how many times are we going to watch this? Like, how many years are we going to watch this dog eat grass? I mean, we've done it for six years now. It's it's not going to get better. <laughs> so you know, I'm, I'm the the Galliardini is what Galliardini is, and I think the he's you know I know that Antonio Conte loves him and everything. He loves you know fine, but but he's not going to win Inter titles. You're not going to win titles if you're dependent on Danilo D'Ambrosio and Roberto Gagliardini, or it's, it's just that simple. I mean, we've done this. We've done this for almost a decade now. So, but I do think they have a role to play, but I just don't think they can be key figures in a, in a title winning seed, in, in a title winning team. I honestly don't think so. I thought, I thought, um, by the way, just to go back to Dermot, I thought he was pretty good actually against Gladbach, you know, for, you know, for a debut. I was, that my heart sank. Yeah. Against, he was uh, brilliant against yeah, the, against Because obviously the, the, the line that we're hearing a lot on, social media the last few days is if Inter had had Hakimi then they would have won the match now maybe they would have done but all we know is that I thought he for, for the player he was I was expecting a lot worse <laughs> honestly I mean to um, me to me yeah. how we I mean to me Darmian on the left and Hakimi on the right that's how Inter should form up with Bastoni, De Frey and Skriniar I mean that that's but yeah. but but, but, but that, that's what I want to see uh okay. I, I I honestly don't understand this Perisic thing I mean, because someone explained to me what the hell is going on, because a year ago, a year, exactly 14 months ago, Antonio Conte was foaming at the mouth in Indonesia after a game saying he can't play as a second striker and he can't play as a wing back. They subsequently sent him to Bayern Munich where he wins the treble as a winger. And now he's a year older and all of a sudden he's a wing back. Like what? What's going on here? I would hope there, there's there's no good explanation. My only hope for some explanation, you know, if we're if we're going with the Mo approach, if we trust that Conte knows what's going on, maybe Conte's plan A at the start of the year was I'm just going to have a bunch of warriors in the midfield and create all the offense through the flanks, and then realizing that's not going to work with Perisic, and maybe the way to do this is to have and the midfield that can create up the middle and use Ericsson more? I don't know. I mean, with Darmian, my whole thing was like, if you, I, a four-year deal was nuts. Like, that was wild. Uh, but in terms yeah. of who he is and what he can do, if you just look at his basically a straight swap for Kondreva, uh, to me, I was all about that. Because not even that Kondreva was bad uh, last year, but it's more just the minute Antonio Conte leaves, Kondreva is useless. Whereas Darmian could be a backup in a lot of ways for a while in almost sure. any system. Sure. Um, and listen, for as many things as Conte frustrates about, you know, I think the, you know three of us at least, uh, say what you will about the man. I think at this point you have to make him the patron saint of mediocre wingbacks. Like <laughs> Victor Moses looks good with this man. Antonio Condreva looks good with this man. Um, Marteo Darmian looks good with this man. Like, Ashley Padre Young Padre looks good with this man. Giannini. But this is what we were saying earlier. You know, he's he's best at players who you know don't lose their best performances when you mold them into a very tight system. You know, that's. Those are the players that he gets to overperform. So, you know, Darmian will always look, you know, reasonably impressive. He looked good for Italy a few years ago when, as did Candreva, as a matter of fact, when he was playing as a, as a wing back there. You know, that's, they're, they're his bread and butter, probably because they're the players that he can relate to the most um, for, from, what, from how he was as a player. Darmian also, you saw his, his, um, his upside on Saturday when, you know, he, Conte could take Perisic off, bring on Hakimi, and you just have to swap Darmian and, uh, and on you go. So, 
um he's uh he's you know him and young have got that kind of versatility which is um which is useful having said that though you know i think you know nima you and i could have played in that back three on saturday and general would have created the same number of chances um, <laughs> because right. you know handanovic was having a coffee for for 90 <laughs> minutes i mean they were they did nothing which is you know is nice we we stopped them but you know, um, it was Genoa, and it was a it poor was Genoa. Genoa team that had had 13 to 17 players off with yeah. COVID. I mean, let's be nice, let's be fair. I feel I feel bad for Genoa that they're forced to play play in these conditions. Yeah. Um, but um, let's move on. I mean, we 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 are playing Shakhtar. Let's quickly um, let's quickly go. You know, I I I think one of the good things I do give Conte a bit of stick when I think he deserves it, but I do got to give him praise when I when he deserves it. And I think what he said after the game. Um, or, or going into the Genoa game about Shakhtar was very, very, that calmed me a lot. When he said that, you see, I don't, um, I, I don't think that the five nil we d- beat them by was representative of the game or the quality of the two teams. That tells me that he, that tells me that he's he's not going to let anyone in this team try to take this this lightly. Instead, they're going to show up really prepared to the Shakhtar game. And and that that's good because Inter have to win this game. Inter need to have four points going into the Real Madrid double rubber because I don't see Inter winning six points there. I think if Inter can get three points there, they should be happy against Real Madrid uh, in, in two ties. Because um, because you see I I'm, I'm not, I don't agree with Mo on this I think that Shakhtar winning against Real Madrid was was yeah. bad news for yeah him. I was gonna I was gonna I that I, I think, think that was good absolutely <laughs> bad news for Inter because that that because Real Madrid that last minute through. goal. Yeah, I mean, Real Madrid, Real Madrid made it 3-3 at the end. It was disallowed. I was, I was happy for about a minute. And like, yeah, God. no, because I think Real Madrid are going to win the group, no matter what. Yeah. And uh, I, I hope I want Inter to join them. And I think that kind of threw a spanner in the works. Because Real Madrid now, after having won the El Clasico, now they're, now they're going to be like foaming at the mouth when they when they, when they they play the, these other teams in the Champions League. And, and mm, I'm worried about that. Yeah. But let, let's uh, let, I mean, I, I think that Inter will win against Shakhtar. I think they'll win 2-1. Uh, I think Lukaku and uh, Lautaro will score. Uh, what about you, Mo? I um, I'm actually less optimistic than you. I think it's a draw. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, I think it's a high-scoring draw. I think uh, we won't see a Lukaku goal. Uh, I think we'll probably see uh, uh, Lautaro and uh, and uh, Hakimi shine, uh, and uh, they'll be too busy marking um, Big Rom, and then uh, we'll be able to. Uh, salvage a point through uh, either Lautaro or Hakimi or both of them. But uh, yeah, I think it'll be a high scoring draw. Mm, okay. Um, Will? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of sort of caught between two stores. I think a draw is more likely. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's tough away from home. Shakhtar looked really impressive last week against Real Madrid. They were, they were really making use of the, I mean, Real Madrid left them a lot of space in sort of between their midfield and their defence when they, they scored their goals. But I kind of feel like that's an area they can exploit with with this team as well. Um, I'd be interested to see which more, mid, mid, more midfield Conte picks. I'd like the same midfield as the Gladbach match, but I wouldn't be surprised if he tries something else just because he doesn't seem to be sure what he wants to do with that midfield uh, definitively yet. And obviously there's a lot of games going on, so he might want to rotate. I think if we don't lose this match, then, you know, it's not over. But... Um, yeah, a, a win would make a very big difference um, because I I was confident we'd get out of this group, but it, that confidence was kind of premised on us winning that match against Gladbach, and we really should have done given the way that the game went. So for sure, um, for sure. I think that changes a lot. You know, it's all it's all well and good saying that we you know we had two shots and, and we conceded two goals. That's not an excuse. That makes it worse, especially when one of them is far worse. Is, is the penalty you conceded and the other goal, which was basically a, a carbon copy of Chiesa's goal for Fiorentina on the first day of the season. You know, there's if, when you play like that, you have to win. I think. So, sure. I th- it's looking difficult. If we win tomorrow, then I'll I'll go back to being optimistic. But it's it's a tricky game. I agree. I don't know if the five 0 last uh, last season actually helps. <laughs> I don't know if no, Shakhtar. I... I think they might have a little bit more um, uh, courage about them in this match, Shakhtar. So um, we'll we'll see. But uh, I don't think we're going to lose. I'll say that much. Mike, any predictions? Can't believe we're living in a world where Nima and I are the optimists and Mo is the, the cautiously <laughs> negative one. But that's about is broken. The world yeah, right. <laughs> it's, it's, um, I, I, am with Nima. I, I think Inter will win, and if there is one reason that I win last week, and I, I do agree that in the big picture for the table, it's not good. But 
I do think it's going to leave them going in there with a lot of confidence. And for some teams, that's good. But the team that I saw, you know, just, gosh, what, six weeks ago? It's amazing that it wasn't that long ago. Uh, but that was a team that, you know, they had a lot of confidence going in there. And Inter won because they let them sort of hang themselves by their own rope, right? It was shocked our making mistakes. It was shocked our pressing. And Inter just sort of baited them and waited for them to fall apart. And I feel like being confident uh, with a team like that probably leads you prone to making more errors. I, I I don't think this is going to be a draw. I think Inter win outright or they lose outright. But I just think, you know what? This is one of those matches I feel like Antonio is going to earn his money because I think Inter, I think he's got the right type, mental approach, as Nima said, right, of I don't think that Inter going to be too high going in here. I think they understand the urgency after what happened last week. And I think Donetsk isn't the type of team that I think does well having a lot of confidence. So I think Inter win, uh, let's say, 3-2. It'll get a little crazy because I don't think this team plays defense. Certainly not like they they did again six weeks ago. Apparently, <laughs> uh, but I don't think this is a draw. I think I, Inter either win this or they lose this outright, and we're either going to feel a lot better about getting to the group after tomorrow, or we're going to think it's over. Mm. Yeah, this well, this we, to me feels like the first big crossroads of the season. This match for sure. Um, so we've had big games. So totally far, agree. This this is potentially an objective that slips away if we if we lose this match. Obviously mm. not definitively, but. It's going to be really, really difficult um, to recover from one point in those two games. So, uh, fingers crossed that they they rise to the occasion like they did in the Europa League a few weeks ago. Um, then we play uh, Parma, and there's not much to say because Parma are awful. Uh, they're really, really horrible. Uh, they're not a good team, and they were lucky to draw against Spezia uh, at home. I think we're talking. I think we're going to see a similar game as against Genoa, um, and and I think it will win two, 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 three nil. I, I don't. I really don't think there's much to say about this game, uh, other than uh, thank God Inter didn't sign Gervinho. <laughs> like that's that's the only thing I can say. Uh, <laughs> like, that would have been the ultimate me, nonsensical yeah. Conte signing. Yeah. Me, Mina mentioned Theo Walcott a few years ago. This is this is the 2020 equivalent, I think, of trying to sign Theo Walcott for. Uh, yeah. <laughs> for <Inter>. Very similar. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. No, I mean, I don't think. I think we all think Parma Parma's gonna. Uh, yeah, they're they're a rabble. I think they've they're, had they're a case of their own, haven't they? Or, yeah, they have. The quite a few, and and also, yeah. I mean, I think I think again, he's for the the way I look at this is that he's preparing for Shakhtar and Real Madrid, and he's counting on the team delivering against Genoa and and Parma and and and, and that's where I, that's where I hold it so so I'm not going to we're not going to waste too much time on that because I think we all agree that Inter are going to win and and there's not much to say really especially after Kulusevski's gone and, and and you know there's there's nothing there so let's move on to the part of the show where we pay tribute rip the piss out of and criticize someone or something heavily in the world of football starting with the positivity by uh, presented by Mr Positivity Mr Mohammed Nasser he's he works a lot he's intelligent and uh, he surprised uh, people sometimes with his uh, ideas. Not easy to find one person of this uh, qualities. Well, look, uh, I, have, uh, I have a footballing uh, Marathi of the week, uh, an inter Marathi of the week, and it has, it's quite straightforward. Uh, we've, talking about him, uh, we've spoken about him bailing Inter out and bailing Conte out. Mm. Romelu mm. Lukaku has been phenomenal. But I'd also like to take this moment to acknowledge uh, one of my uh, favorite sporting uh, uh, personalities out there, Habib Nurmagomedov, uh, uh, UFC uh, MMA fighter, uh, lightweight division. Uh, over last weekend on Saturday, uh, defended the, his uh, title for the fourth time and decided to uh, uh, retire uh, undefeated at uh, 29 uh, wins and no losses. Uh, the only, uh, the only mixed martial artist at that level to be able to do that sort of record. So uh, the guy is, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, a real uh, ideal uh, role model uh, inside the octagon and out- outside, um, real real class act. And um, yeah, I just wanted to, uh, you know, uh, pay a little bit of a homage uh, to uh, Habib here, right here. So, yeah. Uh, let's uh, move on to something a little bit more comical. This week's Frog, which will be presented by Mr. William Beckman. Yes, I actually have two frogs because I've realised that my first frog is needs has a bit of an asterisk next to it. This is the year of the asterisk, so why not have a frog <laughs> with an asterisk as well? Um, the, the obvious choice seemed to be this this poor referee in Serie B who got a little bit confused um, last week when he was refereeing a match between uh, Ascoli and Reggiana. Uh, the very, very colourfully titled Francesco Meraviglia 
which is a really happy name. I think we could do with more people called Francesco Meraviglia. It's a Frank, Frank Marvelous, if you were going to um, put it in England. So Fra- poor old Frank, he, he had a goal that he disallowed in the 93rd minute for offside. And um, it looked from the, the still image as if he'd, he'd indicated the VAR um, uh, sign, despite the fact that Serie B doesn't have VAR. So um, really making a fool of himself. But um, Luca Marelli was very good on all these sort of refereeing interests, has done a blog post about it. And he's explained actually that um, he didn't do the, the VAR gesture. He just sort of put his hands above his head for, for no particular reason. And then as if to sort of wave his hands around and say, no, no, it's offside. Because apparently he's a referee that, that seems to he use his arms a bit too much. Um, so I don't think that that story was quite as funny as it first seemed. But I have just found another one which is not football related. Um, it's a poor woman who and this is very much frog territory. Um, this is I've seen this on the Daily Mirror. It says a woman has said she was left physically cringing in a ball of shame for 40 minutes when she realised she had accidentally donated a bag of very personal items to her local charity shop. <laughs> um, she explains that she, she and her husband had been having a clear out and were bagging up a lot of old possessions. They went through baby, toy, uh, baby clothes, toys, wardrobes and kitchen drawers during the declutter. Um, but um, she also had a sort through her private quarters in, in, in uh, quotation marks. Um, <laughs> and apparently this came in the form of a bedside drawer, which I quote, oh, contained yeah. sex toys, as well as other important items, including some very sentimental jewellery. Um, she said, I've Jeez. never felt the sensation of physically cringing in shame like this before. Um, after I was able to stop saying, oh, my God, and explain to my husband what I'd done, I crawled up into a ball with my hands over my ears for about 40 minutes trying to process it. So just like in all us interisti after most intermatches in the second <laughs> half of last season, that was my that was my go to page. Um, so that's that's a, that's a very embarrassing moment, um, which yes. uh, I, I obviously. Um, oh, no. So hang on a second. So she, oh, she was asked if one of her sex toys had batteries by the man in the shop. Oh, God, this gets worse the more I read on. OK, yeah. Thankfully, this woman doesn't have a name, so we can't shame her. Yeah. Yeah. Check your. <laughs> Check your bags before you give them to charity yeah, shops. That's yes, my message do. for this week. Please do. Um, right, let's move on to something much more negative. This week's Mod G, which we presented by Mr. Reverend Mike Pilucci. the Christian Eriksen thing one more time, really just about any player in this squad when it doesn't work. We hear so often about um, this person is not an Antonio Conte player, right? Mm. And we we talk a lot about how he needs to adapt his tactics. But I, I want to take this, I want to take this thought exercise a step further, right? If the idea is that a certain player does not fit Antonio's tactics, that implies that Antonio tact- Antonio Conte's tactics are unimpeachable and un, you know, are, are truly above reproach because they're so successful. And so I wanted to take a quick thought about what exactly that has meant at Inter. Uh, Antonio Conte's tactics uh, gave Inter a second place league finish, not as close as it appeared because they dropped points to a bunch of teams after the restart they should have beaten. Uh, It meant losing the Coppa Italia semifinal despite allowing one chance of note to Napoli. It meant losing a Europa League final because he would not adapt his game plan against a Sevilla team that tore him apart. It means... Christian Eriksen, Marcelo Brozovic all the time, even though anybody watching this club knows it's a terrible idea. It means Roberto Gagliardini in huge matches. It means transfer market moves to get specific Antonio Conte players like Arturo Vidal and and Alexander Kolarov, who have directly cost Inter points this season already. And I say all of that to not to say he's a bad coach because Antonio Conte is a good manager and he has made progress. But uh, for 12 million euros, there needs to be a lot more. And those tactics that he refuses to adapt and that, as I said earlier, I don't believe that, you know, that sort of instrangience of this is the one way we play. I don't think modern managers win that way, but those tactics, if that's what Antonio Conte's tactics are, if that's what Antonio Conte guys do. Next time I hear anybody call Christian Eriksen not an Antonio Conte player, I'm going to take that as a compliment. Mm. I hear you. <laughs> I hear you. Well, that's all we have time for this week. I'd like to thank Mina Arzuki. I'd like to thank you, Mo. Thank you very much. It was an absolute pleasure. And that uh, Moji was not supported by me. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Mohammed Nassar, and I do not endorse this message. Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, uh, Mr. William Beckman. 
Thank you, Nima. Uh, we've come to the end of a very confusing episode where I've almost called you uh, Mina and Mina <laughs> Nima about three or four times. I think I've got away with all of them. Yeah, you did. You did. Um, and also Mr. Mike Pialucci. Thank you, guys. Let's hope we're all smiling a little more next week. For sure. Uh, as uh, I'm your host, I hope you're definitely right. And until next week, I'm your host, Nima Tawale Rutsari, wishing you a good week, health, safety for you and your loved ones, and six points, and sempre e solo, forza Inter. <laughs>